Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Council on Foundations annual member meeting featuring a keynote address by Fred Blackwell. Thank you for being here with us today. All right, and for this first section, let me welcome and bring on stage a few members of our board. Uh, we're going to start with Tony Mestres, President and CEO of the Seattle Foundation. Also joining us are going to be Kathleen Enright, President and CEO of the Council on Foundations, and our keynote, Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation. And to get us started, I will hand it off to Tony. There we are. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and uh, it's a great pleasure to have you join us today. Thank you. I'm Tony Mestres, President and CEO of Seattle Foundation. I'm a proud member of the Council of Foundations Board, and uh, you may have noticed that this year's annual meeting is part of a broader member week, uh, with this event really serving as the kickoff. And in addition to today's meeting, uh, we're also providing a number of other opportunities for council members to connect through a, a member hour tomorrow and an Ask Me Anything with Kathleen and the council's leadership team on December 7th. So I was really honored and excited to be able to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, he is a, a wonderful friend, a partner in the work that we all do. Uh, he is a teacher to me. Now, Fred and I joined uh, the Large Community Foundation CEO cohort at about the same time, five or six years ago. And we came from very different backgrounds. Fred has a career just steeped in uh, service, both in government as well as in the social sector. Uh, he is an incomparable leader in terms of thinking about the role of philanthropy and, uh, and community and uh, racial equity. And also, uh, we both have a penchant for asking disruptive questions. I, I generally find that when Fred does it, people are inspired. Uh, when I do it, people are mostly just disrupted. Uh, but I have also uh, found that uh, his knowledge and his work in thinking about how philanthropy can do better and how foundations can play a role at this critical time in our society uh, to fill in this leadership gap that I think we all recognize uh, has been a, a, a tremendous example for all of us across the community. Uh, as I mentioned, he has a, an extraordinary career. Prior to, to San Francisco Foundation was the city administrator at the city of Oakland, uh, served in the San Francisco uh, mayor's office, uh, has also uh, really been a, an extraordinary leader in, uh, in community development, was the director of, of the executive director of San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, and then prior to that also worked uh, both at the San Francisco Foundation in his first act and with the NE Casey uh, Foundation. So with that, I'd like you to, uh, to meet the guy who is on the other end of the red phone between Seattle and San Francisco whenever I feel nervous or uh, anxious about some decision that I might make. I pick it up and I call down south and get Fred's advice. Fred, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Tony. It's really a pleasure to be with you all. Um, and thank you, Kathleen, for the uh, invitation uh, to uh, be a part of the member meeting this year. Appreciate the introduction, Tony. I always, when I get your call, uh, know that you've done something wrong and I've tried to get you out of it. Um, but anyway, uh, it's really great to uh, be with you all, like I said. And what I want to do, I guess, over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes is Kind of give you all a sense of the, the work that we've been engaged in and the, the journey around racial equity from a community uh, foundation point of view. Uh, and to give you a sense of both what that journey has been, uh, also kind of give you a little bit of the high points around what we've learned, uh, and then talk a little bit at the end uh, around kind of what we see as next on the agenda and what now. Um, but before going into all that, I wanted to just kind of give you all a warning label on the remarks that I'm gonna uh, make. And the, the first is that, um, you know, what has worked for us and what uh, uh, has worked in our community is just that. Uh, everybody uh, has a different uh, a circumstance and context that they're working in, uh, a different set of organizational uh, opportunities and challenges. And so uh, hopefully what I can give you is a good sense of like what we've done, um, and also kind of spark the right questions uh, uh, with you and your organization, but it isn't uh, a playbook, uh, to, so to speak. Uh, the second is that, you know, when I talk about this stuff, I talk about it in, uh, in ways that are linear, uh, in ways that uh, are confident, uh, and part of that is because uh, while I'm often wrong, I'm rarely in doubt, um, but the other, 
uh, is that um, this thing is messy. Uh, and so while it sounds linear, it sounds like we may have it uh, figured out, we don't. Uh, and I guess my, my warning to everybody is uh, don't trust anybody who says that they do have it figured out when it comes to uh, racial equity. It's really, uh, we're on a journey uh, to achieve something and, and get to a destination that none of us has really seen before. Uh, and so many of the solutions uh, are on the horizon and not in the rearview mirror. Uh, and then the last thing is that, you know, uh, I work in a community foundation, and so I'm going to speak from a community foundation point of view. Uh, and I think that some of the things that uh, uh, happen in community foundations are applicable to other grant making institutions. Uh, but I think I just want to kind of emphasize that, you know, much of what we're, I'm going to talk about is kind of unique and not unique, but just kind of particular and specific to the context that we're working in. So let me just start a little bit with our journey. I started, uh, uh, like Tony, in this work uh, in around 2014 at the uh, San Francisco Foundation. And in 2015, uh, we launched our work around uh, the racial equity uh, agenda. And uh, for uh, the most part, I spent the first three months or so at the foundation trying to find the bathrooms and just basic navigation. But then after that, really pivoted to a, a very uh, external facing uh, posture with the foundation. It really spent a lot of time listening to community and listening to partners. We held a series of town hall meetings at uh, various levels of geography within uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. We're the San Francisco Foundation, but we really have a regional footprint in the Bay Area. And so our listening tour uh, really had that regional perspective. And um, one of the things that was interesting about those meetings, and this was kind of uh, late 2014, early 2015, was that people brought up a lot of issues that were unique to their community, but probably at the end of every meeting, issues around race and class started to come to the forefront and people started to uh, express concerns, optimism, uh, all kinds of things around those issues. And it was really interesting to me that race came up at the end. Uh, but then when I thought about it, it actually made sense uh, in that it takes a while for people to build up the kind of uh, trust and momentum to talk about race, one, but I also felt that um, people did not want us to leave the room uh, without us knowing that this was an issue in their community. Uh, the other thing that we did was we uh, did a series of uh, kind of longer, uh, almost retreat-like sessions with policy leaders, partners, thought leaders uh, in the Bay Area, asking them what they thought were the, the pressing issues of the time and the pressing issues on the horizon. And again, in those meetings, uh, issues of race and equity came up again. Uh, we took that, uh, both of those, those kind of community meetings and those other sessions, along with kind of uh, just reams of data disaggregated by, by race, by geography, by issue area. Also, the data really highlighted the, the disparities and things like that uh, as it related to race. And we took that to our, um, our board. Uh, and I think that if the first part of this chapter uh, is about listening, the second part of this chapter is really about engaging our board. Uh, and our board, um, we did a few things with them. One is we shared what we heard from community and what we were seeing in the data. Uh, but the other thing that we did was that we uh, asked all of the folks who were leading prominent bodies of work to make presentations to the board around kind of how their work might look different if they were to adopt a a kind of explicit racial equity orientation or lens to the work that they were doing. Folks made really great presentations, um, but the board said one thing that was really um, important and put us on a very different trajectory. Um, and a board member who basically said, these presentations were great, but it feels like old wine and new bottles. Uh, and that if you're really serious about adopting racial equity and economic inclusion as a North Star. Yes, we think you should move forward, but you need to move forward in a way that is unencumbered by the way you're currently organized and approaching the work. And so uh, in that way, I kind of got what I wanted from the board in terms of a green light, um, but also got a little bit more than I bargained for because um, really it was both um, inspiring and terrifying to think about spending the next year thinking about how we would be able to approach that work uh, and really kind of in a way that not Humpty Dumpty off of the wall. 
Uh, and so it was really about um, uh, kind of a clear slate. And it, as a result of all that, and I'm gonna um, kind of skip over a lot of stuff that we may be able to come back to in question and answer, but the long story short is that we completely reorganized ourselves around uh, that North Star. Prior to uh, this work, we had been organized for literally decades around traditional issue areas like community health, community development, arts and culture, education, environment. Uh, and when we adopted this North Star, we also adopted an organizing frame that was about kind of organizing ourselves around uh, the pathways to regional equity, which revolved around the concepts of people, place, and power. And so while those other issues that I talked about and that we were organized around before didn't go away, but we started to think about them differently. We started to think about them in relationship to the people, place, and power frame. And I just wanna touch briefly on that frame because I think it's important in terms of the way that we are uh, approaching the work. The people work is really about um, lifting the floor uh, and improving uh, conditions for low wage workers uh, it looks like I'm having a problem here. Hold on one second. All right. So, you know, we're not in, I know I'm in the right meeting when there's a technology problem, uh, but I'm back. Um, so the people work is really about lifting the floor for low wage workers and improving and, and, and creating a set of circumstances that is really about fostering a greater sense of economic mobility. And while part of that work is about the things that you would guess around workforce development and uh, worker organizing, a big part of the work is about removing barriers to economic opportunity. So that has led us into uh, bodies of work that are around, focused on criminal justice issues, uh, immigration issues, uh, even access to high quality education as well. Kind of that barrier removal work. Uh, the place work is really about the preservation of space and culture. Uh, for low-income communities and communities of color. So a lot of that work is focused in on affordable housing, preventing displacement, but a lot of that work also focuses in on arts and culture because we think that that's a really important part of placemaking uh, and uh, how people identify with community. Uh, the power work is really about the recognition that you can have all the great ideas you want uh, under the banners of people in place. But if they aren't connected to a constituency of people who are demanding change, the change won't happen at the scale of impact that we're looking for, nor uh, will it have the sustainability we're looking for. So the people work is really about strengthening and amplifying the political and civic voice of low-income communities and communities of color. And we grapple a lot with whether that should be its own area, whether it should fit within the other areas, but we really concluded that that was an important body of work in and of itself. And we thought that the most powerful strategies that we could support were the ones that were at the intersection of people, place, and power. So that's the way we organized. And I think if I were to kind of sum that work up, it is really about organizing ourselves around the North Star and associated with that was a lot of organizational development. Last thing I would say in terms of how we are approaching the work is just that. How we approach the work is really important. Uh, so this has changed the way that we interact with donors at the San Francisco Foundation. We have moved away from kind of the, the arms race around assets under management and thinking about how we can continue to grow. And we've moved very much into a, a framework that is about how do we um, get donors to align with us around this issue in this North Star around racial equity and economic inclusion. That has led to a much deeper partnership between the part of the organization that is engaging with donors and the part of the organization that is doing the programmatic work at the foundation. And it has also colored, uh, it has also really colored the way uh, that we um, work with donors. Uh, a lot of our work really is focused in on uh, sharing what we're learning, inviting them to be a part of what we're doing creating learning atmospheres with donors so that they can talk with one another and get access to the folks that we're working with. Um, the second thing is our grant making has changed. Um, we are doing larger grants. We're doing more multi-year uh, grant making. We're doing more general operating support. But most importantly, 70% of the grants that we are uh, um, uh, issuing now are being issued to organizations led by people of color. Uh, and that is a really important 
uh, component of our grant making. And I think it's a really uh, important thing for folks to consider in this work. Our investment changes. Uh, we, 30% uh, of our assets under management are being managed by uh, managers that are women or people of color. Uh, we think that, that this is not just about what we do with donors and how we do our grant making, but really about um, uh, how we also leverage our uh, investment opportunities uh, to achieve our mission and align with our mission as well. Changed our culture. We are now really focused in on having an internal culture that is commensurate with our external ambition. Uh, and that has meant a lot of things in terms of personnel policies, teams that have been put together to uh, examine what the way that our culture works, really working hard to have an inclusive culture. We fall short of our ambition just about every day, um, but we are really always trying to work to make sure that we have an inclusive environment. Uh, and then the last thing is our leadership and voice. Uh, this North Star influences how we show up, where we show up, how we use our voice, when we use our voice, and who we use it with. And so all of those things are really important uh, components of kind of where we are. A few things around what we've learned, and I want to uh, run through this fairly quickly, but I think that these are things that are really important. One is that um, when you draw a line in the sand around an issue like racial equity, People show expect for the what to be different, but they also expect the how to be different. Uh, and you know, in philanthropy, uh, we spend a lot of time um, building up really nicely worded grant making guidelines uh, and try to do that in a way that invites the kinds of proposals that we want to see. Um, but when it comes to racial equity, people want to see that and they want to interact with you differently. And I think that that's really important. So if you have the, you can have the best grant making guidelines articulating why you're focused in on racial equity and how you're focused in on racial equity. Um, but if you still aren't answering people's phone calls, if communities of color still have ac uh, problems accessing program officers and having access to your institution, uh, if we are still condescending in terms of the way that we are interacting with folks who are seeking support from the San Francisco Foundation, and if we are still um, showing up uh, in ways uh, that don't uh, really display our values, we are falling short of what we say we're trying to do from a racial equity point of view. And so I think the thing that I want to just emphasize here is what I said up top. It's about the what and it's about the how. Uh, and I think that that's very, very important. Uh, the second thing that we have learned is that um, when you dig into these issues, you better get comfortable uh, with the discomfort associated with conversations about race. Um, and, you know, those of us who have been engaged in these conversations know what they can be like. They can be emotionally charged. They can be uh, yeah, spark anger. They can spark emotion. Um, and if any of you are like me, uh, those are not the kinds of conversations that I'm rushing into. Uh, but those dynamics, the discomfort associated with the conversations around, with regard to race, prevent us from developing um, language uh, around these conversations. They prevent us from having the kinds of conversations that we need to have. Uh, and what happens is that people look for off ramps. Uh, and so that's when people start to develop proxies for race. Uh, and start to talk about um, what about income? Um, what about um, gender? What about um, uh, uh, gender identity? Uh, what about sexual orientation? And the answer to the question around what, a, what about is absolutely yes. But we have to also wrestle with and rest with how those issues intersect with race and until we're able to have a real conversation about race, we never get there. Uh, and so getting comfortable with the discomfort is something that is really important. Third thing that I think is really important for folks to get uh, around this and that we've learned uh, is that this is not the path of least resistance, um, which means that um, you've got to really think about um, what you're willing to risk what you're willing to give up, what you're willing to sacrifice uh, 
if you're really going to be serious about an agenda around racial equity and inclusion. Um, not every board member is going to be ready for this conversation. You will lose board members, you will use, lose donors, you will lose staff people. For a lot of people, this is not what they signed up for, not what they want to work on, not what they wanted to spend their volunteer time working on. And you've got to ask yourself up front, like I said, what you're prepared to lose, sacrifice, give up, or risk. But those aren't the only things. Um, in philanthropy, uh, one of the most important pieces of currency is reputation. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can get an article in the Chronicle of Philanthropy or the Stanford Innovation Review. We spend a lot of time thinking about a carefully crafted um, uh, portfolio of grantees that has the respect and admiration of our colleagues. My mom often tells me, what's the use of having a good reputation if you're not willing to risk it? So I think really asking the question around what you're willing to risk, what you're willing to sacrifice, are you willing to uh, lose some donors um, because of the fact that you've decided to focus in on a thorny issue? It's something that you really need to interrogate and ask yourself up front. The, the way that I often talk about this is that if you're really serious about this work, you need to be looking for the third rails rather than trying to avoid them. Uh, and if you haven't been electrocuted a few times, you're probably not engaging in the work at the level that you probably need to be engaging in. Last thing, and there are a whole lot of things that I could talk about in terms of what we learned, uh, but the last thing I want to mention uh, is don't skip leg day. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, for those of you who spend a lot of time in the gym, uh, you know, uh, people, your, your trainer will tell you not to skip leg day. And uh, I'm one of those people. People tend to focus in on arms and chest and all those things uh, that people want to see and that it's uh, on display. And those things for us in philanthropy, is our, that's our grant making, that's our investment work, uh, that's our leadership work. Um, but in order to be effective in this work, you also have to invest in your infrastructure, your, um, your grants management, your finance, your HR, all that kind of stuff. Those are the legs exercises. Those are the deadlifts of this work. Uh, and so can't skip leg day is, I think, a really important part. It's not just about the sexy external facing work uh, when it comes to racial equity. It is about the guts of the organization as well. And if that isn't operating well, you're not going to achieve what you need to um, externally. Um, let me finish with this in terms of what's next uh, and what now. Um, you know, the, the, the last few months and probably close to a year now um, have been really um, for some challenging, for some invigorating, uh, but it's both create a lot of challenges and opportunities. And those challenges and opportunities are associated with um, the disproportionate health and economic impacts associated with the pandemic on uh, black and brown communities and communities of color. Uh, it is also focused in on uh, the systemic changes that people uh, are calling for as a result of uh, obviously law enforcement, but there are also other systems that have been uh, brought to the forefront that need to be changes and so changed. And so there's been a reckoning around race, but there's also been a reckoning around systems and power. Uh, and so for us, um, there are a few things that I think are important. One is, you know, we have always been uh, trying to figure out the right balance between charity and change. Uh, around programmatic and service-oriented work versus the systems policy advocacy work uh, as well that we think needs to occur in order for uh, substantive change to occur. We really, I think, over the last uh, a few months and on the horizon are focused in on the transformative change piece of work, not as a um, instead of the, the work around programs and uh, in services, but in addition to, and I think it's really important uh, for us to think about on the horizon, how we balance um, the charity versus change work within philanthropy. Um, the other thing that's on the horizon for us is an even greater emphasis on power. Um, the, the focus in on uh, supporting organizations led by working in communities of color, pursuing transformative change uh, is important. And important in that is really investing in the kind of power, the kind of advocacy 
that is needed in order to produce that change. Uh, and then the last thing that I would say um, is that we are really focused in on and will be focused in on root causes uh, when it comes to racial equity. Uh, and for us, what that means is uh, no longer participating uh, in the gaslighting uh, that occurs in this country around uh, our foundation. Uh, and what I mean by that uh, is um, we've got to come to terms with the fact that uh, the country is really built on uh, the pursuit of free land and free labor. That pursuit of free land and free labor resulted in slavery, bondage, and genocide for Black people and Indigenous people in this country. Uh, and if we're, so if we're really talking about racial equity. We really have to get to the root causes. And getting to the root causes means centering uh, anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism in this country. And when I say centering it, I don't mean um, in a way that um, kind of calls on us to uh, engage in the oppression Olympics around what community is worse or better off, nor do we want to uh, fan the flames of um, the false dichotomy uh, that one community's gain has to be another community's setback. What I mean is that if we're serious about this work, we've got to center that anti-Black, anti-Indigenous um, um, reality uh, in a design point of view. So just to give you an example, you know, again, uh, you know, those who know me know that I quote my mother often, Angela Glover Blackwell. Um, the curb cut effect is something that she's talked about and written about. It's real, the curb cut effect is really about the fact that uh, if you know curb cuts, they are the, the places in the road that go down on the sidewalk, that go down to the street. They were invented or brought into the forefront because of the the advocacy on behalf of people with mobile disabilities so that they could get around just like everybody else. Uh, but then when you look at the curb cuts and you look at who's using them, uh, you can see the lawyer with the briefcase uh, and the rolling briefs using the curb cuts. You can see the mother uh, with the stroller who's using the curb cuts. It's a perfect example of how you would create an intervention uh, that uh, really reaches the most vulnerable, this benefit for everyone. So when I say uh, centering anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism. I'm not saying uh, that uh, every grant and all the interventions that you focus in on, focus in on that population, but if you design it so that it works for them and that it, and it works to uh, unravel that part of uh, racism in this country, it will work for everybody. Uh, and so I'll leave you with that. Uh, I think it's really important for uh, us to think about that as a really an essential uh, component of the work. And so uh, Kathleen, again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to share our story and some of the things that we've learned. Uh, and uh, uh, good luck for the rest of the, uh, uh, the membership meeting. And uh, Tony, great to see you as well. Fred, that was just um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, some of those lines, sir, the uh, look for the third rails um, and make sure that you're on them. Don't skip leg day. Um, I think we're going to have to annotate that one for folks so that they know what we mean by that. But that's going to stick with the audience, I think, for sure. Um, we are going to facilitate a couple questions for you. And Tony, I think you can jump in and ask some questions of Fred, too. Um, I, you know, I loved the idea of having us here to be a little audience for you because um, I, it was great to be able to to just um, uh, be with you in this speech. Um, I appreciated uh, just being able to to be, you know, uh, in community with you as you were speaking rather than just viewing you as as we're in this virtual world. Um, you're already getting a lot of reactions from the audience. You should know that they are very, very positive. Uh, you gave a little bit of the context of, of COVID and the current reckoning with racial um, inequity that, and how that's affecting the San Francisco Foundation. Um, but I'd love for you to just go a little deeper, if you don't mind, um, and then I'll take some more of the questions from the audience. Community foundations are particularly um, pressed this year. Um, and in your region, Specifically, yeah. you're not only faced with um, multiple, um, uh, you know, 
uh, consequences at the same time in your communities, um, you are the center of the response um, in, in all of these circumstances. And, uh, you know, it seems like your, your past several years of, of work have prepared you to be those responders, um, but I just wondered, you know, what your reflections are with the work that you've done over the past 10, 12 months. Yeah, there, there are a few things that I would highlight. And the first thing is um, really encouraging is that um, in, in March, April, when, when things really started to, to kick off and get in the high gear, um, we actually, rather than um, kind of just starting our own fund, um, collaborated with the East Bay Community Foundation, uh, with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, uh, and a number of other community foundations in the region that established a centralized fund uh, to uh, populate and then to redistribute uh, dollars. It's, that was a first for, for us as a community in the Bay Area to, to um, kind of create a, a collaborative fund uh, across the region where we would uh, work together rather than the silos. And I think that that's really important. Uh, the second thing is that for, in addition to that, we also created a fund, and that fund was really about um, uh, focusing in not just on kind of the basic needs that was the focus of the first fund, um, but also the needs of nonprofit organizations uh, in this moment. Uh, you know, the, I, I would kind of put um, the, the crisis into like three categories. One was this need for basic food, shelter, and clothing. Then there was a question about just basic nonprofit survivability that we thought we needed to respond to uh, as well. And then uh, by the summer, there was this call for transformative change. And so all of those things were at the forefront and they all required slightly different kinds of reactions and interventions. And I think that that is important. Um, just about across the board, when I talk to colleagues, um, uh, donors, uh, at, at uh, community foundations have stepped up in ways that have been extraordinary as well. Uh, and so um, figuring out the platform to um, help donors make sense of all of this and provide vehicles for them to engage and uh, utilize their philanthropy has also been uh, a key component. But then the, the last thing that I would say is that we have really been um, deliberate about finding the smaller, underneath the radar uh, organizations that are working in community uh, that have really strong tentacles and connections in community and really high levels of trust, mm -hmm. but aren't necessarily naturally on our radar. So the other thing that I would say is that we've had to be deliberate about going out and finding the trusted um, institutions at the community level and not wait for them to find us. Uh, and I think that that's been a, a, a really important uh, lesson for us. The, the last thing I would say is um, we increased our own spending. Um, we um, uh, we uh, increased payout from our endowment uh, to do disaster um, funding and um, are also uh, in relationship to the transformative change work um, are in a conversation with our board right now about increasing payout for the next three to five years mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, really think about that as um, a surge grant making to take advantage of the, what we think is an opportunity right now uh, to take what has been clearly a different moment around race uh, and make sure that we're doing our part to take, make sure the moment has staying power and turns more into a movement. Uh, and so we're anticipating that money really to focus in on uh, organizations led by working in communities of color, a big emphasis on uh, Black-led organizations and Black-led organizations that are building power in community, not just delivering services. Yeah, that's that com that intersection of the people and the and and the power, right? Yes. Um, I love that um, uh, the way that you talk about your new strategy. You're getting a lot of questions, so I'm going to see if I can handle a couple of them from the audience, um, so that you're being responsive to them. You talked about the how and the what, and there are a couple of questions. Um, about the how coming from the audience. Uh, yeah. One person wanted to know a bit about um, 
whether or not you're, um, as you're leaning into your equity work, if you're changing your procedures in terms of grant making um, requirements, your reports, your assessments, your applications, those kinds of things to reduce burdens on grantees. Yeah, the answer to that question uh, is yes. Um, uh, you know, prior to this, well, I'll back, let me back up a little bit. This was a, a lesson uh, that was a tough lesson for us to learn. Uh, we were feeling very proud of ourselves around the fact that we had pivoted to this focus in on racial equity. Um, we invested a lot in our uh, technology uh, and infrastructure in order to have online applications and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we wanted to have data as part of that so that we could know whether or not we were moving the needle. Uh, and the long story short uh, is that um, we did a CEP survey that was very humbling. Uh, and, um, you know, what folks told us was that um, we were still encumbering folks too much. We weren't as accessible as we thought we wanted to be. Our language was too complicated. Uh, we, got, we got a high level of critique. And that led us to um, going back uh, and uh, doing more simplification. We're currently working on uh, simplifying even more. Uh, we also, as a result, brought grantees um, in uh, to the organization to help us design our guidelines. And uh, we had focus groups with folks to actually test the technology before we roll it out to make sure it wasn't too uh, onerous. And so, yes, we are um, loosening restrictions. We are making it easier for uh, folks to access dollars. And we are also um, creating a situation where you can come through more doors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we have an open cycle, we have an um, a invite-only portion, uh, we have a rapid response fund that we've launched, uh, and people can come through doors where they already have relationships with us. And so that's a, another thing that we've done. That's terrific. There are several other questions about the how. One of them has to do about aligning your, your investing assets, you know, the way you're investing your assets with your North Star of equity. Um, how's that? Is that something you're already doing? And if so, um, yes. what are you doing there? It is. Uh, and, you know, the, the two key components to that. One is um, having a, a real conversation with our investment committee um, uh, about um, the need to align our investment uh, with our mission. Um, and also there's a component of it that's have it about having real conversations with our consultants. Uh, the folks who kick tires and develop pipeline and the, uh, be more uh, um, upfront with them uh, about what our expectations are of them around bringing us opportunities to find uh, women and people of color who um, uh, can manage our funds. But beyond that, um, we, in partnership with our donors again, have expanded our program related investment program. Uh, we've taken $10 million from our endowment to uh, see that, and that's been matched by our donors. Uh, and this, over the last couple of years, we launched a $50 million uh, mission aligned investment uh, uh, fund as well that uh, um, allows us to invest in public and private equities that we think advance the, the equity mission as well. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, so one more, I guess everyone wants to see how you did this, how they get it done. Um, they're interested to know about what the, I'm sure that there was training that you did with your board um, and your staff related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I guess they're wondering uh, what that looked like. Yeah, um, that is work that is ongoing. And I'll, I'll just tell you about a few things. One is, um, one of the things that I launched early on at the foundation when we first started to get into planning was Fred's First Fridays. Uh, and what that was is that we, uh, on the first Friday of every month, actually shut the foundation down in the afternoon uh, and engaged in some level of learning around what we were doing around the equity agenda, whether it was uh, showing a documentary and having a conversation uh, about the implications for our work. We brought in a series of uh, really fantastic speakers who could uh, unpack um, concepts that people talk a lot about but don't really pay the time, uh, spend the time defining. I, just as a sidebar, uh, one of the things that I talk about a lot uh, is that uh, equity is kind of the new coconut water uh, in that 
Uh, you hear people talking about it a lot, but you don't see a whole lot of people actually drinking it. Um, <laughs> so, um, the just spending the time with staff and all staff uh, to introduce these concepts, unpack them, have conversations has really been an important part of the work. Yes, we have also engaged our board. We have engaged our board uh, in a very ex experiential way, um, using resources from AFI and consultants from AFI, the Association of Black Foundation Executives, uh, to um, introduce these concepts to the board. Um, microaggression, intersectionality, uh, systemic racism, what it means, why we think it's important, how, how they have, their lives have been impacted by it. So that's a, another piece of the work. And uh, now what we're doing is what we're calling learning together, it's where we periodically bring the whole staff together to really go deep on issues like I talked about that people um, uh, um, talk about but don't really experience in a lot of ways. And really, of fine folks who can come in uh, and uh, do that work. And the, the last thing I would say about this is that, you know, I talked in the presentation around getting comfortable um, with the discomfort associated with these conversations around race. Um, it is important to not to confuse discomfort with lack of safety. Uh, it is important for us to create a safe environment for these conversations and. Uh, to make sure that people can uh, lead these conversations in one piece. That doesn't mean that there won't be emotion, tears, things like that. Um, but I think people confuse um, discomfort with lack of safety. And I think it's important to distinguish between the two. Uh, and I think it's important to provide a safe container, but I also think it's important not to go overboard and water down the conversation so much that you don't really engage in the, in the kinds of conversations you need to engage in. That's beautifully said, Fred, thank you for that. I think we have one more question, one more question for you. And I think this, the Community Foundation folks in the audience of which I bet you there are many because I'm sure they wanted to hear from you. Um, I really appreciated how you talked about uh, getting out of the arms race, you know, how assets are the measure of success rather than actually the impact you're having in, in your community. Um, so one of the folks wants to know about how you really bring your donors along on the racial equity journey and get them to align with your priority around people, place, and power. Yeah, so um, that started in the beginning. Um, we held, a, as I talked about in the community engagement piece in the beginning, uh, I talked about kind of the town hall meetings and those other sessions, but what I forgot to mention was that we did focus groups with donors. So as we were thinking about the people, place, and power agenda, as we were uh, looking at the data, we were also engaging donors in that work and bringing them along uh, to learn with us why we were doing what we were doing and what we thought was important. So that's one thing. The second thing is that we um, have been holding um, salons uh, with donors around issues around, like particularly over the last few months, concepts like race and democracy, uh, concepts like, um, um, you know, elections and election results and what they look like and why they were um, happening the way that they were. We bring in thought leaders uh, so that it isn't just them hearing from us, but also them hearing from other folks who are uh, engaged in the work. If, if I were to sum up the work that we're doing, we're throwing a lot of spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, and uh, we are uh, doing a combination of kind of the broad stuff that I just described, but we are also um, doing um, spoon feeding. Like we will put on our donor portal um, regularly a list of folks that uh, we have vetted and think are doing good work in this regard and giving that opportunity uh, to donors. We've expanded the number of um, uh, donor advisors that we have on staff so that uh, we can uh, do more of the one-on-one -on -one, uh, cultivation uh, of the work. But, you know, I will tell my community foundations uh, colleagues this too. We have lost donors, um, some of whom have volunteered to leave, uh, some of whom we actually had to ask to leave because of inappropriate uh, remarks and things that they were doing uh, in response to what, the way that we were moving. Um, and some were uh, frankly engaged in grant making that wasn't aligned or no longer was aligned with what we were uh, trying to do and, and 
with our values. And so uh, we have lost donors. We have gained more than we have lost. Um, but I don't want to uh, sit here and suggest that this work doesn't involve uh, some friction uh, and doesn't involve some loss. That's all part of living your values, right? It's, it, yes. it's about that third rail, too. It's certainly well worth it, I would imagine. Well, Fred, thank you so very much uh, for being the draw for our annual membership meeting. Um, I don't imagine we would have gotten uh, multiple hundreds of folks to come just to observe the uh, the regular uh, business of an annual membership meeting without you as the, the star attraction. So thank you so much, sir. Not just for that compelling talk, um, but also for the incredible leadership uh, and service that you and your team at the San Francisco Foundation have shown this year and over the past several years, um, but particularly this year with all of the devastation um, that your community has faced. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having me and thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, rib Tony a little bit. <laughs> Tony, thank you for uh, the intro uh, 